Skype Q and A. Uh, so we will conjure Nancy right now. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> about the films first? Um, I, I'm hearing an echo voice. Uh-oh. We had such an amazing connection earlier today that it was almost too good to be true. Let's see. How about that? Is that a little bit better? Hello. Hello? I'll just have to put up with it. Can you hear me? <laughs> we can hear you, actually. It's coming in and out, do you think? I had a... <laughs> Yay, Skype. Okay. Do you, think, do you think it's manageable? Can you actually understand what I'm saying? I can hear you well. This oh, is good. better now. Yeah? Yeah, I'm not getting the echo now. Oh, perfect. Okay, awesome. Okay, so we can all welcome Nancy again. Hi. Well, I think if people have questions to start off, that would be great. If not, um, I can try to think of something to say. So, um, Does anybody want to start? I have a question. Okay. Hello. Hello. My name. My name is Jim. How are you? Hi, Jim. I like your films a lot. They were really, uh, really, really cool to see in this in this setting, on a big screen. Very, Thank you. Very good uh, audio. Okay. I, was, I was just wondering a couple things. What processes did you use to make the images? Um, and secondly, do you know the musicians personally who made the, the audio track? Uh -huh. um, well, in the first film, okay, your question about the images. Um, so um, in both films, I use found footage from archival kinds of sources, a lot of stuff that um, the government made for different reasons. And um, the beauty of stuff that's produced by the government is our tax dollars paid for it so that um, it's in the public domain and it's you don't have to pay to use it. So. Um, a lot of that footage was created by different agencies, um, the army and that kind of thing. And then there's footage that's, um, I mean, most of the rest of it is shot around my house or in my studio or animation. Um, and the music in the first one on a phantom limb, um, the composer John Cooper is someone that's worked with me on other films, and um, he teaches at the College of the Atlantic where I teach. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And um, he um, we he worked with me also on the Emma Plume trilogy, which was the three films before on a phantom limb. 
and um, I did the like sections where there's sound collage and that kind of thing. Um, I did those parts, and then the second film, um, I wrote all the songs, and then Zach stories, and I played all the instruments and um, um, mixed that second one um, behind the eyes. Sounds sounds really good. I, I really like the I really like the songs. I really like the uh, the the style, of the music. Thanks. Mm-hmm. I I guess I could go on talking to you, but probably some other people do as well. All right. Hi, Nancy. Hi. I'm Shasky. Hi. I can't actually see. You don't have to. I'm not, <laughs> not that remarkable looking. <laughs> um, uh, I'm like a huge Rebecca Horn fan. Uh huh. Um, and uh, and there's a lot in your work that uh, not similar, but uh, uh, the the sensibilities and the conversation are similar. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm wondering uh, since. Jax told us that the work that you make has a lot to do with, I mean, uh, first of all, the, the, uh, the Phantom Limb was autobiographical, and mm -hmm. she said that you had had, a, you had had a really sort of brutal brush with um, the beyond. Um, yeah. and, uh, and so I'm wondering how you feel, because there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of sort of dismissing women artists because of their pathologies. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm wondering how you feel about sort of the general attitude towards your work. Do you, do you feel like what you're speaking about is more universal or if it's particular to trauma? Um, well, in the um, Phantom Limb one, I mean, it, it is about trauma, but it's also... Um, and that probably is universal in a way, although medical trauma is not universal. There's five million people a year that are going into ICU um, experiences, and a third of those people are coming out with post-traumatic stress disorder or depression or cognitive problems. So that's actually a project that I'm working on with um, some of the Harvard affiliate hospitals and with um, Vanderbilt Hospital, they have sort of ICU delirium projects that are going on that I'm doing some collaboration with. Um, but it's sort of a huge problem, like more people have uh, medical trauma than have, and, and the after effects than have heart attacks, but nobody's really heard anything about it. So. I'm trying to work on raising awareness about that. Um, but I think there's a lot of other levels to the work. Um, you know, for example, I think it's, it has the same themes as Frankenstein, for example, or it also has themes that relate to kind of more mystic or shamanistic kind of um, uh, narratives so I think some people are going to relate more to it as a piece of that first film about a piece about trauma but other people might see it um, more about like I just participated in a series that was um, part of the Flaherty seminars and it was presented in a series that was talking about animals and our relationship with animals so I think there's a lot of different threads um, that are universal in it. Um, I, I, I think I ask also because uh, there's, you're using your own body and you're using, certainly you're talking about the femininity of your own body, but at the same time, I'm not, I'm not really feeling like there's a feminist bent, so I wanted to, I wanted to see if you had felt pigeonholed by that, yeah. and the other thing that it made me think of was uh, Donna Haraway, 
uh -huh. um, which is a distinctly gender directed work and and but it's very unavoidable when you start talking about like the cyborg stuff and yeah. how you know construction goes in that direction so it's yeah. incredibly incredibly beautiful beautiful work and um, I'm really really privileged and happy that I got to see it so well, um, thank you thank I, you um, I'm definitely you know have read Donna Haraway and um, in fact I kind of parody her in, in one of my earlier films that she appears as a puppet um, doing a <laughs> kind of song lecture um, which I, I ended up talking to her on the phone for some other reason and told her about it and uh, sent her the film but I um, I didn't I didn't hear back from her <laughs> she didn't sue me so that was great thank you so much thanks Hi Nancy, my name is Carolina. Um, I really, really enjoyed your films. Thank you so much for having this uh, Q&A with us. Um, so I have two questions, and one of them is about color, the other is about sound. <laughs> um, I noticed that you have like, a lot of vibrant colors in your films, I guess, so I wanted to hear about that. I guess if you can talk about those choices. In the first one, um, towards the end, I noticed navy and then yellow. And then in um, behind the eyes or the ears, there was like pink in mm -hmm. the beginning. So I don't know. If, I'm sure you had like intentions behind that. I'd love to hear them. Well, um, the two films you saw are the first films that I have made that have color. Every, everything else is black and white, and they're actually black and white. But I just um, added, you know, color um, filters or color. Um, tints to the black and white and part of that was I guess the uh, influence of films like Napoleon like Abel Gans I don't know if you know that film silent era kind of um, and there's a, other silent era films where they would add um, a tint to a scene usually it was more practical to sort of indicate day or night um, but I was thinking of the color in a more emotional sense and um, was influenced to some degree by a name now that I won't be able to think of, an Italian cinematographer um, that, oh my gosh, I think he did a lot of stuff, I'm going to say, for Bertolucci. And, um, has written a great deal about cinematography. And he talks about color as being um, sort of representing different stages of life. And so that was sort of how I thought about it in, um, uh, in the films to some degree. That's great, thank you. Um, and then I, too, like Jim, really enjoyed the music. And I was wondering if there was um, soundtrack available for that behind the eyes or the ears because I love that I didn't even know that it was you until the credits so it was fantastic yeah there's actually we have free downloads um, yay, yay. if you go to my website because I'm trying to remember now the name of the uh, everything is flown out of my head the name of the site I should have sent Jax, I don't know why we didn't think of this. Like, I have DVDs for sale, but if you go to my website, you can find that. NancyAndrews.net. NancyAndrews.net. That's easy, right? And there's also a link there for free downloads. Um, oh, it's a, a website called Reverb Nation. Mm -hmm. And so if you look up the name of the film behind the eyes or the ears, there's free downloads of almost all the songs. The only one that isn't there is the Jackson Brown one because I never was able to get um, permission to use that song. Understandable. Well, I didn't put it on the web. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks. No, mine already got asked. <laughs> mine is just a general question, really. I mean, it's nothing really specific. Can you hear me without the microphone? Nope. I can hear you now. 
You have the microphone? I guess you can't hear me without the microphone. That was my question. <laughs> Anyways, I just wanted to ask, uh, this is probably something I could find out after the fact, but I thought that you're here, you know, might as well ask you where you were, and, and you mentioned that you teach. You know, I don't know much about you, so I just wanted to know uh, where you were and, and what you taught and what okay. school and, 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 and this kind of thing. Your, your room that you're in looks really great. It looks like you have a good bookshelf and all that. That's, that's my stu I'm in my studio, which is in Maine. Uh, and I don't have a map handy, but um, do you know where Maine is? <laughs> I want to go to Maine to really Scotia. bad. Yeah, well, it's just, I'm about as far east in the United States as you can get right now because I'm on an island called Mount Desert Island, which is a big island, um, but it's pretty far what we call down east. So um, hmm. at the first uh, sunrise in the morning in the United States here, and um, we're quite well, you can't get too far from the ocean because we're on an island. So, and I teach at College of the Atlantic, which is a, a small college with about 300 students, and um, we offer only one degree, and it's called human ecology. Hmm. Sounds like sounds like you guys got it focused. Well, it's very interdisciplinary. Um, yeah. School don't have departments and. Um, Students make up their own programs. So, yeah, and no, I I went to a small school myself at Paul Smith's College in the Adirondacks for yep. for a time, and I I love that forum, small school. Yeah. Um, but that sounds great. Man. I would love to. Uh, what What's happening on the island where you live? Is Is it a Is there a very Everybody small population? Asleep right now. <laughs> Everyone's asleep, huh? <laughs> What is like the population of your island? Is it? I mean, I'm just curious. I mean, if these are too, too detailed or anything, you don't have to answer. But I was just, I just like to know where the the content that I'm seeing is coming from. Yeah. You know. Well, some of the like the ocean, um, the kind of churning water scenes that are were in the first film. Those were shot off the cliffs here. So Maine is a very um, well, the, what they say about this place is that it's where the um, sea meets the mountains. So it's very cliffy and rugged kind of coastline and um, a kind of dramatic place. And it, half the island's National Park, Acadia National Park. So it's a very popular destination for um, travelers. In the summer, we have millions of people come here. And in the winter, they all leave. So we get the island to ourselves. So kind of the best of both worlds in that way. Um, but in, in the summer, we get a lot of cruise ships. And I'm sure there's people in the room that have been to Bar Harbor, Maine, which is um, a well-known resort town. So. Well, thank, thank you for answering the questions. That, that was very interesting. <laughs> Well, you can't see her because um, this is Chastity again. My daughter Ruby is sitting right next to me. Um, she enjoyed your films very much. She's about to turn nine, and she was, she was well, conceived about ten minutes away from where you are. <laughs> <laughs> and she was she was uh, she was born in Maine Medical Center, so oh, it's yeah. very funny. So she's she's very she's being very shy right now, but she liked the movies a lot. Thank you. Good. So we've had people who haven't been to Bar Harbor, but even closer. <laughs> we got some questions back here. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about um, the project you mentioned where you're working with the hospitals and the intensive care patients. So that's also, if you, I feel like I'm doing an infomercial. If you go to my website, there's a more description of that. But um, I'm working with an organization that's based in Cambridge, Massachusetts, called Artists in Context. And um, we're working together. And we just started this for the last couple months. But we've been sort of reaching out to some of these centers that are 
kind of centers of excellence that are really on the forefront of trying to um, do research around ICU delirium and its effects on people and um, and what we're trying to do is see how the film that you saw the first film and there's a lot of drawings that were associated with that film um, trying to kind of work out how those might be useful either to the healthcare providers um, to help them understand better the experience of patients um, or possibly we're also kind of trying to create some stuff that might be useful for people who have been through the experience to try to identify their own feelings about it which probably wouldn't be the film so much but more the drawings and we're trying to um, do a show in Boston that would be near the Brigham and Women's Hospital at Mass Art, which is um, an art school with a gallery. We're trying to get a show there of drawings and of some of the drawings and installation um, work that I've done, and then invite um, the medical community. And we're doing a few forums um, this next month. We're doing it in Cambridge. We're doing a screening where we're in, we have um, we're going to have a discussion with some of the people that are doing research in this area, and we're doing that again in Portland, Maine, and um, I'm probably I'm presenting at a conference this summer called Comics and Medicine. That's about um, comic like comic books and uh, medicine. So just things like that. It's not direct related I'm not like going into ICUs but it's um, more just around those um, programs I guess so we still don't know where it's all gonna go at this point but experimenting very cool. yeah we're in dialogue and we're creating some of these forums and just sort of trying to see what will come of that thank you for sharing Hello. Hey. I had a question about, you mentioned post-traumatic stress syndrome, mm -hmm. um, and your film seemed to be reflecting your own experiences with um, your near-death experience, your hospitalization and so on. And since your film is an example of sharing these things and obviously connecting with other people who've had similar experiences, at what point, if so, do you think sharing and discussing and these types of things come to a point to where putting them aside may allow them to heal? Do you think there's a point in which you don't want to suspend something so that it can go into the past and stay there? Well, um, one of the traits of post-traumatic stress disorder is, is sort of a um, to, most people are compelled to tell the story again and again. You know, it's like a, and I don't know, people may have had this experience when something really difficult happens, sometimes you, you just have to tell people about it and you keep telling people about it over and over again. It's like, I think what it is about is like, I think it's a good thing to get it out of your own, to, to move it into some other form and um, to sort of get it out of your own system in that way. And I think if one is compelled to do that, that it's best just to keep doing that until you feel like you don't have to do it anymore. Um, and I think some people have chosen with trauma not to deal with it, but I, like, I think that if you don't, that eventually it comes out anyway in some other way. Like I met a woman who's a filmmaker um, who made a film that um, I don't know if people are familiar with, a documentary called My Terrorist. And then she made a film called My Land Zion. And um, she's an Israeli filmmaker. Did anyone see those films? I think so. No. Um, definitely try to see My Terrorist. It's a really remarkable film. I think it was screened on like, you know, HBO or one of those channels and also BBC. But she, 
um, was in a bus on, she was a stewardess and she was um, in Israel um, being shuttled to a flight that she was going to be working on and it, um, this was in the 70s people that are old enough may remember this um, and they were the the bus of, of, of people that were like stewardesses and pilots and stuff going out to this one flight was attacked by a terrorist and some people on the bus were killed she was injured and the person next to her was killed so she went through this really traumatic experience and then she just went on with her life she got married she had kids and she's been a guest here a couple times so we've talked a lot and you know she didn't realize she had post-traumatic stress disorder and it all sort of came out like 20 years later um, mm -hmm. and then she had to deal with it so um, it would be great just to be able to go and be in the past but it doesn't always work I guess I mean that's the goal to let go but it sometimes takes a while hello hello it's Jack and um, I'm actually a psychologist in training. I'm a fourth year uh, doctoral student in psychology. And mm -hmm. I really uh, agree with you very much that, you know, current, the current thinking is much more that if you have a trauma, that retelling of the story, that kind of compulsion you, you talked about, mm -hmm. it's, it's much less about leaving it behind and it's much more about kind of integrating that memory or that experience into your life in a way that's safe that you can talk about it and, and have it yeah. and you're not reliving it in as traumatic a way as it right. was originally um, right. and there's actually an approach that um, called narrative therapy that's exactly that where you're retelling the story and you're kind of tweaking it each time into a way that's that's safer and and that cognitively helps you integrate it and process it more. Um, yeah. And some people do that by themselves by, by talking about it as well. Yeah. Um, so I was wondering with the making of the movie, um, how did the story change in making the movie than maybe if you were talking about it beforehand or thinking about it beforehand? How did putting the, the movie together change, uh, change the story for you? But I think what I was doing in the movie to some degree is making the main character who is sort of, you know, is myself, but, but it's also at the same time like a avatar for myself, like a, a more heroic figure, um, you know, with the cape and that kind of thing. So, I mean, that sort of changes the story to make yourself into a superhero. Right. Yeah. Yeah, there was definitely that sense where it, it started off uh, sort of the, you know, the empathy for the character was that it was a victim and that it was all very confusing. Um, and by the end, it was definitely very empowering and triumphant. Um, mm -hmm. So do you feel like com like uh, making the movie and kind of showing it and sharing it like, like you were talking about is a way of working through that and, and kind of do you feel more triumphant now that you're coming out the other side? Yeah, I mean, it's, I've been dealing with this for about six years, and um, I mean, I haven't just been making art, because I do that is my natural thing to do. I mean, I've been going to therapy once a week for almost six years, too, so, you know, um, with different kinds of treatments for PTSD and that kind of thing, but um, uh, it definitely, is getting better, less flashbacks, less nightmares, um, and all that kind of thing. So um, it's also been really difficult, but nice to be able to go back and, for instance, have a meeting with um, medical staff at the hospital that I was treated at and not be there for medical reasons. Like, it's empowering to kind of be able to be an advocate, I guess, for, um, you know, not just for myself, but for other people that may not realize that this is what's going on in their lives, you know? Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Well, I think we have time for one more question. Um, if there's anybody.
else around here? Yeah. We got one more in the back, and then. Uh, Hello, I just had one more quick comment. I brought the question up a minute ago about the sharing of your post-traumatic experiences. Yeah. And um, there's a very interesting paper online, and I don't condone it or recommend it or endorse it in any way. Uh -huh. But what it is is a massive, like, 100-page or something refutation on the entire concept of group therapy, which has its place but this paper, I think it's something called the Orange Papers. If you search, you could probably find it, but it's a massive Alcoholics Anonymous refutation. Mm -hmm. And it's very interesting. And it just kind of highlights the shortcomings of this peer-oriented alleviation for any number of problems that come up in people's lives and um, I just wanted to recommend it. Mm -hmm. I actually know nothing about group therapy, so. Um. And I'm not like saying anything bad about AA. I'm just saying that the paper brings up some very interesting refutations about things to keep your guard up in when you're going through counseling or when you're going through sharing processes with other people. Mm -hmm. And there's just, there's just two sides to it. Mm -hmm. So there's good things about it, and there's not so good things that I noticed. And so I was just bringing it up as a very interesting read. Okay. That's all. That actually leads me to my next really quick question. Um, you strike me as an avid reader, and I just, um, just to end it on one last thing, could you maybe tell us anything interesting that, that you've read in the past couple days? That's something that you find super intriguing that you'd want to share to the um, them? Well, I haven't had a lot of time to be reading because I've been working on a, trying to make a feature film and I had to get together a huge package of stuff to try to make that happen the last couple of weeks. And I haven't had a lot of time to read, but I've been trying to catch up on some classics like uh, Mark Twain. And um, this summer I read a lot of H.G. Wells, which I highly recommend. Um, the Island of Dr. Moreau, which is not unrelated to um, the films that you just saw. But it's, a, it's not a long book, and it's fantastic. Island of Dr. Moreau by H.G. Wells. Fabulous. Awesome. Well, let's all say thank you to Nancy for being here. We really appreciate you taking the time to spend your evening with us. So. Good night, Nancy. Good night. Talk to you soon. Well, thank you all for coming out. You're welcome to stick around for another beer and um, and chat. <laughs>